with that, I would introduce the first panel, Minister Linkavichus, uh, Ambassador Ildum, Mr. Alex Eichen, and Mr. Stefan Wallin. Please uh, take your seats. Before we start the discussion, some um, administrative out, um, announcements. First, we have a conference app. I encourage to download it because that has a lot of functionalities. That is the way we have a dialogue even if you don't have a stage. Um, if you download the app, remember the uh, social media, use hashtag RigaStratcom. Um, we also have a couple of uh, side events during the conference. You're always invited to the COE corner. You'll have a chance to do some 3D and test the game application. Are you able to distinguish between fake and true in the information environment? And also, please check the app. There, this evening is going to be a cartoon exercise. Uh, we have gathered some really good cartoon experts, and we challenge you to write the ideas, what they should uh, picture, what are the stories they should put up, and see what comes out of it. Because as you have noticed, tomorrow we have a whole panel on the art of economic communication. And I think that would be a good lead into that. So download the app, use the applications. Now on to the panel that is to kick off our conference the politics of strategic communication. And I think presidents gave a perfect lead-in to the discussion with all elements there, not only focusing on what we typically do, the post-truths, but also having some look back at what we are and what we are being one of the elements that we represent in our communications. And of course, on top of it, we add on the phenomenon of post-truths. On top of it, we add on the phenomenon, or not phenomenon, the hostile activities by other actors, including Russia, but not, also, not only Russia. How do we tackle that? I recently um, heard a very good comparison. To build a bridge, we establish facts. We don't do bridge, bridges on fake facts. How do we build political process where there is a, at least an increasing talk of people preferring to have fake emotion rather than a credible hard fact as a basis of a dialogue? How do we do that? to make our political discussion function, on top of it, having also a external actors with a deliberate effort trying to undermine processes, including the election systems. So these are the questions I have, and I think in a, converse, in a matter of conversation, we'll try to seek out different angles and takes on how to deal with that and, of course, engage later on with the audience. But first, Minister Linkavichus. Lithuania has been at the front line of information confrontation, if one might use the Russian word for it. Um, you've seen things that many countries now discover as a, a new phenomenon. Um, can you tell us during the ex year's ex experience, what have you found? What works? What doesn't? What advice would you, from your experience, including personal, being in a political life for such a long period, what are the recipes? Are there recipes? Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I'm not a doctor, so I will not issue any recipes. <laughs> Also, I'd like to wish that this post-truth era will not bring era of lies and mistrust. It's also very important. And it uh, could be a very long answer to your question. Because I believed that we managed to convince 
not just each other, but some of our colleagues, especially in the European Union, that uh, this uh, strategic communication is important. That we are living in the situation of hybrid threats. That we really have to not just to face these threats, but also to counter. And uh, I believe we still have to do the utmost in order to make sure that this is really serious. Because we are not doing enough. And uh, some time ago, when we tried to find out what should be done in the uh, area of strategic communications, we were asked by some colleagues that what we are talking about, are we talking about censorship? Are we talking about prohibitions? Are we talking about something what is, or, or European propaganda, let's say, which is not the case? No, no, we try to say we are talking about uh, not censorship. Definitely we have to make sure that our work is uh, uh, delivering something like making sure that our information is assertive, our information is accountable, our efforts uh, facilitate, uh, to, so to say, to uh, launch alternative sources of information, which is still very important. Why I'm saying this? Why I'm saying that I'm not satisfied? I'm not satisfied with the status of our activity in this regard, uh, resources which are allocated. Because you know that big machine coming from other side uh, and well-equipped, well-financed, billions of dollars or, or euros, whatever you can call, and delivering uh, so-called information. A couple of days ago, we had, uh, we had a seminar on security of journalists in Vilnius with a wide particip participation, including uh, Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, a channel Russia Today, what I'm usually calling Russia Yesterday. <laughs> and uh, really, uh, and you know, I didn't know they are in the, the room, frankly, because usually we are talking, but they are not uh, present. It's very easy to talk. <laughs> but at that time they were present, and the first question from official guy was, uh, he spotted in my speech uh, terminology like information war, he said, right? Is it war? Who declared the war, he said, what we're talking about? I said, it would not be any war if Russia would not wage that war, you know. And when journalists from Russia today said, we're also journalists, we're also working in media, we also should be protected because we also have to live in a secure environment. Uh, so what do you mean so that we are state-controlled media? What that means? I said, that means a lot. Journalism is journalism. You should uh, respect your profession. But if you are deliberately spreading lies, and my example was very simple, about uh, Russia's role in Ukraine. Uh, I said, you don't know that uh, Russian manpower, weapons, heavy weapons, rocket launchers, tanks of Russian Federation are on Ukrainian soil? Do, you don't know that? Uh, it was no answer, basically. It was uncomfortable, so to say, silence. That, that's, I, I said, that, that I mean. If you are as a, as a journalist, if you respect your profession, uh, as a citizen, uh, not just journalist, and you're deliberately spreading uh, that kind of, not information, but lies, it's something else. And that means we have to find out and sort out uh, what we're talking about. If we're talking about freedom of speech, okay. If we're talking about freedom of media, it's very important for any democratic society. But uh, it's not freedom to lie. And lies, not alternative points of view. Because sometimes our friends and colleagues and neighbors providing, we have alternative points of view, uh, they have a right to exist. Yes, views, they are, have a right to exist, but you're deliberately spoiling uh, population, spreading lies, and brainwashing people. I'm always comparing that with the artillery attacks, you know. Uh, artillery attack is quite, I see mili many military people here, you know, on the eve of real battle, uh, having this artillery attack, offensive, and then real fight uh, coming later. Now you do not need artillery attack. You can brainwash, and then you can come, so to say, and make your deal. And by the way, it's cheaper, because it could be multiple use. Missiles you can launch, and that's already done. If you, meet, if you, if you of course, if you hit a target. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you can have this multiple use, uh, as I said, and definitely very efficient, very efficient. And these days, this is war. So since we still, not all of us, I believe those who are here, the people dealing with strategic communications, they, could understand what I'm trying to say. Uh, but, but many colleagues still believe that we working in vain. We do not do, shouldn't do that, you know, it's freedom society. And so, uh, short answer, because I'm already answering to a question too long, <laughs> but my point was that still, we're still in the stage of understanding what, what's going on around. We're still in the, the stage of spotting uh, like something like animal. <laughs> one, one more, so to say, point I'd like to, 
tell you, during Russian Forum, uh, we have this very good tradition, Russian Forums in Lithuania. We're inviting intellectuals, writers, scientists, uh, opposition freedom fighters, We're talking in Russian about Russia, about future of Russia. Uh, it's uh, not far from Vilnius, uh, those Baltic friends know, Trakai, nice place. You know, and suddenly, uh, during the forum, uh, beer was spotted in the surroundings, <laughs> you know, it's not, not so, so usual, by the way. So that it's a hint, or maybe a reminder, but it's not enough to spot, it's not enough to trace. It's important uh, to hunt, maybe, if, if, if it's dangerous, until it's not too late. So we're still in the stage of spotting, and not yet doing enough in order to cope with it. Well, Minister, you've been one of those uh, European foreign ministers that have argued for quite a long time that Russia is waging information warfare. For, I would say, quite a number of years, far um, earlier than the generic discussion uh, emerged in Europe and United States. But as I hear from you now, you think they did not listen. How do those who believe that, how we make people listen and, and pay attention? Again, very difficult to say. It depends on the individual. Uh, it depends to whom you're talking. It depends on his personal experience. And it takes time. It's much better than it was before. I can't say, really, it's true. But this ice opening exercise is still, still happening. And uh, sometimes it's, uh, we need some personal, maybe, engagement, I would say, or even some drama. Uh, Save God these lessons, but what I have in mind, I have in mind MH17, for instance. Before MH17 and perception of something like terrorism or, uh, or this, so to say, attacks, uh, well, after. It's really different, completely different. Uh, I, I've been probably told in some audience, but I'm always repeating uh, my, my own experience uh, during Charlie Hebdo, you know, tragedy, when they were killings, and we all remember this, and uh, we were expressing uh, solidarity with France. We all said, Je suis Charlie. Uh, I was among those who was also taking part in this peace march in, in Paris, and I saw faces of, uh, you know, uh, citizens of Paris. They were affected personally. It was not just offense against Charlie Hebdo, but it was personal attack and against, against their way of life, values. And that was really very touching, you know, and we all said, we should see Charlie. But in a couple of days, we had discussions in, in Foreign Affairs Council uh, at that time, and I, asked, I also explained that story. I said, we expressing solidarity with France. Definitely, needless to say, but, uh, but I asked at that time, how many Ukrainians should be killed in order to say just few Ukrainian? Because they were killed uh, at that time. Now it's less, but at that time it was every day the same number. Almost. It was very uncomfortable silence in the room. I believe the question was right. There was no answer to that question. Now maybe that answer would be in a different way. What I'm saying, that situation changing, but not yet changed. We have to be smart enough uh, to understand things before they happen before they can threat, the threat. I'm, I'm not talking about anything, you know, like paranoid or whatever. We were paranoid uh, some time ago, before we went to Caucasus in 2008. No one, no one believed what we are talking. After uh, Crimea annexation, less, less uh, so to say, accusations. But we still need something to happen in order to understand. So uh, what we are doing here, or what you're doing here in this uh, second conference, but professionals meeting, networking, exchanging best, best practices, arguments very important, arguments. And to understand that we cannot work on our own, you know, we, we cannot leave lies unattended. We have to deny if they are obvious lies. We can, should do that very, very quickly, not to wait half a year uh, to clarify things, because this spoils, this makes damage. Sometimes this da damage is irreversible because we should understand that we're working with the audience not necessarily interested in politics. Those who are interested in analyzing, reading papers, you know, making conclusions, but those who are not there passively receiving this information or so-called information, which is not news at all, and they are already ready to manipulate them then. Then we have phenomena uh, as, as elections, as referendums, and people voting not for the for this something or to punish government or like, like it was you know, in some countries to punish uh, Brussels bureaucracy. And then we see what happened to this populists, radicals coming into the power. Very natural. It's also a consequence of our misbehavior, misperception. 
And uh, it, it really lays the responsibility with the governments, first of all. You cannot uh, be angry on people who are making decisions to punish government they they not trust. If it's a gap between so-called elite and people, if, if people are not informed, if people simply do not know what the elite is doing, uh, reforms or whatever, what for they are doing, why these people should vote for, for these people, the so-called elite? Why? Again, it's our task. Because it has to do not with terrorism necessarily, it has to do not necessarily with something very bloody, so to say, but it has to do with the statehood, with the democracy. And, and uh, you, you know, really very long answers to your questions needed. <laughs> Well, we'll have a whole two days for that. Well, Ambassador Maybe Il you, but not me. <laughs> <laughs> Ambassador Ildem, uh, both presidents referred to this information as an element of national security. Also, uh, Minister Linkowicz uh, draw a very straight line between national security and ability to confront um, the external threat. Uh, typically, NATO refer, uh, people refer to NATO when there is a security issue. And we've seen also in this part uh, of a country, where people, uh, part of Europe, where people say, this is a security issue, NATO take care of it. You're now Assistant Secretary General. You're spearheading the NATO efforts to modernize its way of communicating. How do you think NATO can play a constructive role in actually bringing in the security aspect in the way we communicate, in the way we defend in our communication space. Well, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm very pleased and honored to be part of this uh, important discussion. It has been more than a year now that uh, I uh, am in charge of strategic communications back at NATO. Uh, and uh, I feel quite excited that things are evolving uh, as uh, uh, day passes. Uh, I remember those days when, uh, with Minister Linkovicius, we were sitting at the NATO Council meetings and strategic communications was referred to as an abstract uh, uh, concept at the time. Uh, basically, we were dealing with uh, ISAF operation and uh, trying to win the hearts and minds of the Afghan people but we didn't have uh, uh, real thinking on strategic communications. Now, uh, I must say that uh, uh, it is very much in the center of every discussion at council meetings and committee level meetings. More and more strategic communications is integral part of policy debating and decision making. So it is not something to tick the box at the completion of uh, any uh, policy issue uh, debated at different uh, levels at NATO headquarters. Uh, we know the challenges that we face, and I think uh, the uh, opening remarks of both presidents uh, were uh, very illuminating, inspiring, uh, and uh, they both touched upon very important uh, aspects uh, to deal with in this process. Uh, it is true that uh, we are confronting ourselves with uh, rampant uh, uh, disinformation and propaganda uh, campaigns. Uh, and uh, uh, we also try to uh, equip ourselves with additional uh, capabilities. And uh, what we do right now is to develop a capability to uh, better understand the information space uh, through developing information environment assessments. Uh, not only to calibrate our communications, but at the same time uh, to be able to uh, see uh, certain early warnings and signs of uh, hybrid uh, actions. And it's quite important uh, to tackle this uh, issue. Second, uh, uh, sometimes uh, we confront ourselves with the question, is NATO doing enough to deal with uh, disinformation and propaganda? It is, of course, important to debunk certain myths, fake news, fake stories, uh, which 
we are doing in our communication efforts. But more than that, we should focus on how to communicate our message, yeah. narrative, and uh, to uh, have our story uh, in the information space. Uh, and for that, uh, we need to uh, be very uh, structured and with strategic approach. Uh, as the uh, presidents referred to, uh, no longer press releases or whatever you post in your website uh, should be considered as if they are uh, read and absorbed by different audiences. We have to be smart in uh, uh, having a proper strategy. And uh, what we have uh, assumed uh, in uh, the last uh, few months is to have campaign approach in our communications, more deliberate uh, and uh, uh, focused approach to our communications, integrated approach with efficient coordination uh, among different divisions of uh, uh, the International Secretariat, but across NATO, between civilian and military authorities, and also coordinating efficiently with nations. Uh, when we talk about uh, campaign approach, uh, it is essential to set uh, clear priorities, objectives. Then uh, to have insights of audiences, uh, to understand uh, what uh, are the peculiarities of each individual audience and how you can target them uh, with tailor-made uh, narrative and messaging using the proper tools uh, that are available to us uh, and reaching out uh, to those audiences. And then to set out a strategy and implementation plan uh, and after uh, completing all this to have regular evaluation how these communications activities are yielding results and how you could recalibrate uh, your course of action. And I'm very pleased that uh, I'm sharing the podium with Alex Eichen uh, from the United Kingdom. And I thought that uh, since uh, they have been extremely successful in this campaign approach, and perhaps I should not refer to Brexit in that respect, <laughs> uh, since you were not in charge. Uh, but uh, uh, we, it, it was uh, quite uh, an inspiring model for our own uh, communications. Now, I have to also emphasize the importance of, uh, when talking about uh, coordination, nobody can expect NATO Secretariat and my division, Public Diplomacy Division, to deliver everything for NATO and allies. We need to have uh, the proactive uh, contributions of each individual uh, uh, ally. Uh, right now, what we are uh, doing is taking uh, the decisions of our leaders from Warsaw Summit meeting of last year and the leaders meeting of 25th of May of this year uh, to take the deliverables as the main themes to communicate to our uh, audiences, home audiences, uh, audiences in partner countries, and also to potential adversaries. And I think what we mean is we have to have an effective communication on strengthening deterrence and defense with a component of dialogue, dialogue to uh, increase transparency uh, and uh, to reduce risks. Also, projecting stability beyond NATO's borders, uh, especially uh, in enhanced role of NATO in fight against terrorism that involves engagement with our partners, strengthening their resilience in uh, addressing different uh, threats and challenges, and also uh, engaging with them because some of those countries are in the front line and they have uh, enough experience uh, and knowledge base. Uh, and uh, I'm also uh, very pleased that we have uh, a very uh, uh, important uh, participation from Finland 
a valued uh, partner of NATO, and uh, Finland is quite resilient when it comes to disinformation and propaganda for uh, certain uh, known reasons. And uh, we try to bring together all these expertise and knowledge base. And what we need to do is, and I fully agree with the presidents that uh, we should not counter propaganda uh, with propaganda, but try to uh, have uh, a knowledge and uh, evidence-based approach communicating the truth. Uh, truth cannot be uh, in the dark, hidden, uh, and we need to expose it. In doing so, the, the important element is to uh, elevate uh, a better understanding about security issues, create uh, a good discussion, and put NATO in it so that uh, uh, we can uh, have different audiences, especially the young uh, audiences. Uh, when uh, uh, we see uh, certain polling, it is very striking, striking to see that uh, the age group from 18 to 25, uh, almost half of uh, this segment of our societies haven't heard the word NATO. Therefore, we need to create a better uh, understanding about uh, how NATO stands uh, uh, for all these challenges uh, and threats. And we need to engage with them uh, properly. Now, uh, last point that I want to make, and since it was also raised during the uh, uh, introductory remarks of the presidents, it is NATO-EU cooperation. And I think uh, since the threats and challenges that both organizations face are the same, uh, it is not uh, a choice but a necessity for these two organizations to have a seamless uh, cooperation and coordination. And this is what we are trying to do. Uh, we have staff to staff uh, level uh, coordination work, cooperation with them. We share our products and we try to uh, draw uh, lessons uh, uh, from the experiences that we individually have. Uh, also, uh, with a view to uh, helping with uh, strategic uh, advice and targeted uh, uh, assistance to our uh, partner countries uh, in uh, uh, their uh, efforts to develop their capacity and strengthen their resilience. Well, Ambassador, obviously for NATO, it's a complex. 29 member states, everyone having their own idea, trying to drive a particular point and wanting to have a specific benefit from the NATO communication from one part. And the other one, um, an institution that is very relatable to the military culture, which is highly hierarchical. And we just heard from uh, President Kajulaid the point that every single neighbor typically has more credibility within his network uh, than any given official. And NATO has like three million plus soldiers that are communicating things. How within this hierarchical culture, how do you see um, you can make it as an amplifying effect rather than something that uh, is a, a problem in delivering straight messages? Well, first of all, uh, it is true that uh, reaching a consensus is not an easy process at NATO, but this is not uh, a point of weakness, but rather uh, a strength. And uh, uh, in uh, having uh, the proper narrative and messaging, what we do is, of course, we need to take uh, North Atlantic Council and the Secretary General uh, to have uh, an overarching uh, political guidance. Uh, and then we, of course, uh, uh, frame our communication efforts, if need be, with integrated communication plans. Uh, therefore, this coordinated effort uh, guide uh, 
nations, but also uh, the chain of command to communicate the aligned uh, narrative and messaging. And it is important to use faces to give the necessary message. It is always important to have the words of uh, the people at the helm of the organization. Uh, Secretary General Sakur, Chairman of the Military Committee, uh, commanders, generals, but we also need to have uh, soldiers in the field taking part in the enhanced forward presence deployments to communicate our message because uh, whatever story that they would be telling uh, would uh, resonate with uh, our home audiences and give a strong message uh, of uh, deterrence uh, assuring uh, our uh, public opinions, but also communicating uh, our resolve to uh, deter and def defend uh, to outside world and to potential uh, adversaries. But uh, this coordinated effort uh, equips us with the necessary means to convey uh, th this message th at different levels, including soldiers uh, in the field. Thank you. Mr. Icon, you're at the very heart of the UK government's communication effort. And as Ambassador Ildam already alluded, the OASIS model and the, and the way UK government is coordinating, um, making sure that everybody is on the same page, um, I think most of the people in Europe ref refer to the UK government's effort as one of the best there is and to be, you know, looking up to. Yet, inevitable questions. As far as the political um, communications go, um, I think many of the room would say they have been not so successful. So, how would you see if one part of a house is considered to doing a good job how can you transfer the ability to, to actually deliver across the national spectrum? Look, my mission is to deliver brilliant public service communications, and that's what interests me. The politics is for the um, our political parties to do their um, piece on. What I find surprising, being at this conference and, and working across Europe and indeed around the world, is that there is a way to deliver really consistently effective strategic communications. And the few, the best, and they can be found in Asia and Europe and other parts of the world, are brilliant at it, but how do we get the rest up to that standard? Now, I think from what I've heard um, uh, so far, I think there are four points I want to make. One around uh, confidence, second around collaboration, third around modernization, and finally around political nous, to go back to your question. And I endorse everything that the ambassador um, has just told us, but I think rather than saying what is NATO doing for us, I think it's important to say what can we, if we are member states of uh, NATO, as the United Kingdom proudly is, what are we doing for NATO? So in the uh, cross-government communications plan, the combined uh, communications plan of the whole UK government, we will publish shortly, there is an explicit commitment in there to run a campaign to demonstrate that we are NATO. And this is a hugely powerful force for good. And I was talking to friends from the Latvian uh, government and the um, British ambassador to Latvia this morning about the effectiveness of the Latvian government's communications when the enhanced forward presence came in with the Canadian soldiers and the soldiers from Albania and Spain marching together with Latvian soldiers. And this, we can talk about fake news and social media, but the television pictures and the real demonstration of commitment is far more powerful than most fake news I have ever seen. Now, I want to deal with this confidence point. If any of you are worried about fake news, I have a memo from the British government, a public memo that is used to warn people of the dangers of fake news and what they should do about it. And I will share it with you. The date on it is March 1683, 300, 400 years ago. It has always been with us. UK government communications is 100 years old this year. One of our early missteps was to tell lies about German behavior during the First World War. 
And come the Second World War, when we were trying to motivate people in the war effort, a significant proportion of the British population said, we don't believe the Germans are evil. You told lies about them during the First World War, so why should we believe these stories we're hearing about their, their atrocities now? So truth and credibility and having the confidence to tell our stories is the foundation of what we should be um, about. Second, uh, collaboration. I uh, chair the National Security Communications Committee for the um, uh, UK government. Cross government, all agencies from the covert to the overt, and it brings everyone together in the room and looks at our objectives and looks at the insight and develops a campaign model for how we can approach the difficulties and the challenges we face. One example of that, which we support, is the um, global coalition against Daesh, which ultimately has to be defeated by military means. But the work of NATO, the global coalition, housed in the UK um, uh, Foreign Office, is an important example about how a campaign approach, consistent with a clear idea at its heart, Daesh will fail, can be successful in degrading their ability to win um, uh, converts. Third, um, uh, the ability to uh, modernise our communications. We've heard very eloquently from the President of Estonia about the challenge of um, 21st century citizens and 19th century government responses. And she said, and I agree with her, that the press release is past its sell-by date. You will all go back to the organisations that you represent and you will happily send out hundreds of press releases from tomorrow or the day after tomorrow onwards. And I think really thinking clearly about where the audiences are online, on Facebook and elsewhere, and yes, they still watch television, is hugely important. One point of dis minor point of disagreement with the president I have is when she said that um, uh, social media and online media tends to restrict people's news feeds. I would commend to you the recent Reuters report, annual report on media habits, which argues, interestingly, that people actually get a greater variety of news from online sources. It's a debate, not a final um, uh, moment, but I think uh, it, is, it, is, it is important. And finally, um, uh, political uh, now. So this is about the politics of strategic communications. And I mentioned that the UK government has a cross-government um, communication plan, all the government departments working together, 113 uh, major campaigns from promotion of NATO to counter Daesh through to the mundane but hugely important things around pensions and welfare and um, uh, tax uh, collection. But nevertheless, um, uh, working together like that and having the discussion with the politicians, with the political leadership, about you have at your disposal a government communications resource. What is the story you want to tell? What is it you want to be remembered for? And how do we tell that story in a way that promotes a stronger economy, a fairer society, and a more secure nation? And where are the bits that government can work together to do that is hugely important. So understanding the politicians, what they want to achieve, and not doing defence or diplomatic communications in a sealed box, I think is part of what it takes to unlock the full potential that you can see in this room to achieve our shared objectives. Well, um, thank you. Um, and as I've said, I think uh, UK government is one of the best there is in Europe in, in these efforts. But of course you have a typically a particular circumstance where you have a one-party government, apart from a few times. But most of the uh, countries in Europe typically have to uh, grapple with coalition. Do you think your approach on delivering this kind of service, public service, uh, in communicating the policies would work as well and as functionally in the um, coalition uh, landscapes? I think it's even more important in a coalition situation than it is in a one-party government. And um, uh, the uh, majority parties in the UK, the Labour Party or the Conservative Party, remember they are coalitions of interest. They are not a, a sort of single united uh, point. So I served the UK coalition government between 2010 and, and 15, and it was ever more important then to say, right, Prime Minister Cameron, Deputy Prime Minister Clegg from different parties, what is it you want the mission of this government to be and how should we express that? Because we will either stand together 
or we will fall apart. And people expect their governments to be competent, like a good bank or insurance company. They don't expect them necessarily to be pop stars or, or, or great um, uh, fireworks or so on. So relentless competence is what we need for the coalition to succeed. And I believe we did that um, uh, in uh, part. So I think uh, having that, doing that political nous work and showing the potential of government communications and certainly a cross-government perspective, this is not just about the narrow interests of the coalition parties. This is about how we bring the domestic and foreign, the security and the economic policies together in one to achieve your mission can benefit everyone. Well, then, and the other one, of course, since uh, the UK government is so advanced in these techniques, I reckon you have thought about uh, the limits and the elements of using big data approach in a communication. I know many have thought about it, but have not formulated. Is there any kind of thinking in the UK government on, for, from the government side, to use big data approach on communicating to the public? It's, it's very kind of you and the ambassador to say we're good at what we do. I am not satisfied, and I think part of the... If we are effective, it is because we are never complacent. We recognise. I was a bit worried earlier on when um, a colleague said, well, of course, we'll come back to this conference in two years' time and we'll have fallen behind again. Why will we have fallen behind again in two years? Surely we should be ahead of the curve, and that's the purpose of this conference and the networking liaison that goes on around the conference. Would be. So being absolutely restless and inquisitive about, well, where do we need to be next week and next month? And understanding, um, uh, do you know your DSPs from your SSPs, your demand-side platforms from your supply-side platforms in terms of programmatic marketing? There is enough capability and actually enough cash in the organisations represented today that you could use digital marketing to reach any audience with any message anywhere across the countries that we um, uh, represent. So we can solve the problem. We have the technology, we have the skills. The question is, do we have the will and the energy? But in terms of uh, big data, yes, um, I am responsible, I understand, for 9 billion social media impressions a year. And we can target young people in Newcastle if we want to encourage them to join the civil service or older people in uh, Cardiff if we want to supply them about pensions. So it is there. There has to be a legal framework and protection of people's information and so on. But against that, we all willingly give our data over through our mobile phones so we can be served various adverts. So it's a proper debate, but certainly the importance of digital marketing, particularly the UK, but also in terms of public relations, great content and the ability to use data to identify audiences is central to future-proofing our work. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wallen, you're uh, chairman of the Swedish People's Party Group in the Parliament from last year, and you had a number of political positions, including, which is of course very relevant in this context, the Defence Minister of Finland. And as it has been said previously by Ambassador Inland, uh, Finland has very strong resilience versus the hostile narratives. But yet, when we look also at our research, and I'm sure also in the discussion, Many of examples, and some are quite ugly examples, of trolling, uh, affecting the journalists, um, trying to uh, undermine the discourse, public discourse, actually come from, Swin uh, from Finland. Um, and of course, very obviously, uh, you are one of those countries in the neighborhood um, with some, uh, I would say, with open doors to many solutions that other countries, like in three of the Baltics, have decided upon. So it is kind of a, I would say, I wouldn't say an invitation, but an option to be exploited by, by Russia to try to make sure that they have an impact on their choices. How do you see? Are you resilient or you're not? And what are the building part of it. Yeah, thank you. The framework you just painted sounds very familiar. And if you allow, I will approach your questions by using a concrete example, also simply because I prepare for it. <laughs> uh, at midnight between December 3rd and 4th last year, three women were 
shot dead just in front of a very popular restaurant, Vuoksenniska, in the city of Imatra in the south eastern part of Finland. Imatra is located about nine kilometers from the Finnish Russian border. Uh, two of the victims were, were local journalists, and the third one, the 43 year old Tina Vilen Jäppinen, she was a popular social democratic uh, politician in the city and a long serving chairman of the, <coughs> of the city council in, of, of Imatra. All the three women died on the spot w because of serious wounds in the head. But immediately after this uh, shocking breaking news had been published, something interesting happened. Someone in the middle of the night uh, decided to create a false Facebook profile in the name of the fictive newspaper Imatran Sanomat and wrote that the three uh, dead women were Russians and that the, the assassinator was, uh, or the suspected assassinator was a retired Finnish military officer. What a blasting combination. But not long after this, uh, the police released its official bulletin and telling that the suspected assassinator was a local Finnish 23-year-old guy who obviously had no political motives for his deed. He had suffered from mental problems and uh, had that night just decided to kill somebody. And the three women, well, they just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time when Jori Larsson and pulled his car, um, pulled over his car at the restaurant, he took a rifle from the boots and just randomly chose his, his victims. He had no military background and he had no political motives. After the police had released this uh, official bulletin and the fact-based debate about the horrible tragedy started, the fake news on fake Facebook was suddenly not more relevant. Well, besides for one person, this somebody who wrote it. And the question is, of course, who on earth wanted to use, well, that is misuse, the short momentum of lacking official police confirmation in order to make it all look like a political, maybe anti-Russian attack? And the other question is, of course, who would have the motives to do this and for what, for what purpose? To whom was the information directed? And uh, what does it tell about this somebody's uh, emotional profile is the f if the first idea you get when you learn about a tragedy like this is how could I squeeze some political tension or suspicion out of this by lying about what just had happened, knowing that the truth will come out just in a while. Well, we don't know the, the answers to these questions, but what we do know is that we have, unfortunately, have to, to get used to this kind of, of targeted uh, disinformation culture, virtual manipulation of, of facts and even manipulation on or with the acceptance of uh, very high-level people in society. Alter alternative facts is already a known phenomenon. All this seems to be a kind of organic part of a multidimensional, the multidimensional information society we have to face in the 21st century by confusing people, especially those who might not have the skills to, to criticize the sources. You can even create a loud and effective assistance towards political leaders, political processes, and even maybe affect the result in a general election. And we think we might have evidence of this, these ambitions already. That means, of course, uh, that uh, the disinformation strategy, the system of, of the systematic using of post-truths is a huge challenge for the democratic, democ democratic system based on the rule of law, based on transparency, and based on the free access to information uh, as we know and re as we respect it. The backside is that we'll say, the chain it is as strong as its weakest link. Well, what does this, all this mean when it comes to the conclusions we politicians should consider? 
Well, the first one that comes in, into my mind is that we have to increase resources in our educational system in order to give young people better abilities to practice uh, media literacy in the di digital world, to identify fake news and to judge the fake news culture. We also have, of course, to make sure that our administration, that goes from the police, the army, the government, the ministries, the national broadcasting companies, but also the, the commercial media, uh, is as well prepared as possible to face all these challenges, or well, let's use the correct word, these threats. In politics, it has for a long time been quite popular to strongly recommend the use of electronic polling as well as uh, referendums to, in general, to show how democratic you are and how modern you are and how much you trust the, the will of the people, the voters. But uh, today with the knowledge we have about the, the existing political ambitions in combination with uh, technological means and possibilities to interfere in political processes, all this, uh, what politicians have been thinking, seems very blue-eyed in many respects. My worst-case scenario, and I even have expressed it in the Finnish parliament, uh, is a referendum about Finnish NATO membership by electronic polling. My fears have nothing to do with the main NATO membership itself. I've been in favor of it for, for ages, in fact. I just can't avoid about thinking the, about the risk that somebody who is not in favor of a Finnish NATO membership and who has the motives as well as the abilities to seriously, seriously damage the public debate, the public opinion, that this somebody even eventually could affect the outcome of the refer referendum itself by using Existing, existing and sophisticated means. That, my friends, would be the bankruptcy of a lot of those values on which we have built our open and democratic society. Well, thank you. And obviously, one of the key values in any given democratic process is trust. Take away trust, the rest starts to crumble. How do you protect it when it is one of the direct targets of, uh, of, the, of the opponent? Mm. Well, of course, trust is uh, it's in fact a two-way. It goes, goes in both directions eventually. But when it comes to the public opinion, the public, they have to be able to trust that the information they get from the official sources starting with the government, the ministries, uh, the ministers, uh, different kind of, of uh, state organizations, but of course also the, what we could say, the serious media, that this information is true. Uh, one risk is, of course, that the competition between media and the competition about being the first one that comes out on internet with a piece of news, uh, leads to a situation where even journalists might fail when it comes to criticizing sources. And they do admit this if you talk with them uh, eye by eye, but uh, in public they might not, not, might not always admit this. And this is of course, also, of course a risk, a competition between, the co competition about being the first one with the news. It leads to, to headlines, that might be corrected later on, but just with little uh, text in the top of, or in the bottom of the, of the, the real story. Uh, eventually, this can lead to, to a situation where, you, where the public opinion is not able to trust even the official sources anymore. So that is that uh, media, of course, need the resources to, to be able to make good journal journalism, because we're very, in de very dependent on that one. The world has never been smaller than today, because we have, so, uh, we have all the technological 
possibilities to get information from the other side of the world. But because of that, the world has never been bigger because we have so much more information to handle than ever before. And that means the filter here in between the public and what's happening in the world, that is the media. And the, the pressure on the on media has, might not, not have been tougher than today uh, ever. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And that the answer to the problem is not looking at what our opponents are doing, but actually looking back at what we're doing, get our resources straight, go straight, processes straight, and energize the problem. And that's the answer, not looking with awe or thrill at what others are doing. And I think in that uh, way, we should continue to look at the solutions uh, throughout this conference. And I'd like you to join me in applause for thanking Thank our... You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.